So today's video lecture is going to be talking about Tom Stoppard's Arcadia. Um, so Tom Stoppard, who started writing plays in the mid-60s, and his most recent play debuted, I believe, in the summer of 2014, um, Stoppard is a quintessential postmodern playwright, um, and his his interests tend to uh, tend to be within two major disciplines. One is history, and the other is the sciences, especially uh, what I would call anti-epistemological sciences. Um, and what I mean by that is the sciences that trouble the way that we know the world around us, um, anti-Newtonian sciences. So uh, in Arcadia, we get really good explorations of postmodern historiography, so um, historiography is the study of how history is narrated or how historical narratives are constructed. Um, and, and one of the things that we get with postmodern historiography is the disruption of the authority uh, that gets vested in history. So we have that. We have, a, we have problematic stories about history. The other major thread that we have in Arcadia is these anti-epistemological sciences, chaos theory and thermodynamics being uh, being the two most prevalent here. Um, so to, to sort of talk us through this, um, I want us to, to start with this notion of uh, the set uh, with his notion of thermodynamics, because this is uh, a fairly quick reference at the beginning, but then the idea that, that Stoppard introduces here um, sort of takes us throughout the entire play. So uh, in this edition, the Norton Anthology, um, this is page 2883, Act 1, Scene 1. Uh, Thomasina says, when you stir your rice pudding, Septimus, the spoonful of jam spreads itself round, making red trails like the picture of a meteor in my astronomical atlas. But if you stir backward, the jam will not come together again. Indeed, the pudding does not notice and continues to turn pink just as before. Do you think this is odd? And so what we get here is this very subtle introduction of one of the premises of thermodynamics, which is that a system will continuously, a closed system, will continuously lose energy. So uh, without new sources of energy input, you can think of this um, like a battery, I guess. Like if you uh, put a battery in your TV remote, it will continually lose energy until it dies. It will never gain energy. It will never increase the amount of energy that it has. So this is one of the fundamental sort of principles underlying the structure of Arcadia. And we can see this if we think about the alternation between the Regency scenes in 1809 with Septimus and Thomasina <clears throat> versus the 1993 scenes or the contemporary scenes uh, with Bernard, Hannah, and Valentine. These two types of, or these two historical periods alternate. Scene 1 is 1809, scene 2 is 1993, and they go back and forth, remaining fairly stable for the first portion of the play. When we get into the second half of the play, we don't, we start to, to sort of lose that distinction where one scene is 1993, one scene is 1809, we start to get scenes that have portions of both. Not simultaneously, but <clears throat> within the same scene, we'll have events going on in 1809, and then events going on in 1993, and they're increasingly occupying that same space, until the last scene, where we have two dancing couples on stage at the same time. We have Thomasina and Septimus, and we have um, and we have Hannah on stage. Um, so, what we get in this last bit here, um, and this 
This would be two, Act 2, Scene 7, 2947. Uh, 2947, for those of you following along in this edition. What we have here is the sort of culmination of this thermodynamics principle, where the borders between the, the two historical times have broken down, and they have bled into one another. So, initially, we have, if we again, if we think of this through Thomasina's metaphor here, uh, we can say the 1809 scenes of the rice pudding, the 1993 scenes of the jam. As you start to stir them, the distinction, the boundary between them breaks down, and you get something that, at the end of the play, is pink rice pudding, I guess. Um, so you get something where both of the historical scenes are on stage at the same time. And what we get that's really interesting about that, um, if we think about the performance here, um, this is page 2947, we have Gus and Augustus, Gus and Lord Augustus. So Gus is the 1993 child, uh, and Lord Augustus is the 1809 child. We have this really interesting stage direction here, near the bottom of 2947. It says, Gus appears in the doorway. It takes a moment to realize that he is not Lord Augustus, perhaps not until Hannah sees him. This, to me, is a really, really important point in this show. So if we think about this visually, if we think about um, what we what we in theater studies call the mise-en-scene, which is the scene, the um, sort of entirety of costume and set and, and the actor's body and things like this. We have a moment when Gus appears on stage and both, um, both Septimus and Thomasina are on stage and Hannah is on stage. So both the Regency period and the 90s are on stage at the same time, and Gus enters. Gus is dressed like Lord Augustus. Same actors playing both characters, same costume. Everything about them is the same. There's a moment when this actor enters the stage when this child is both. Gus and Augustus. So simultaneously, this character is divided between almost 200 years. And this is a really interesting moment, because one of the things that this does is it sort of takes us to the end point of that thermodynamics component. This is where everything has blended together, where a character is both the Regency character and the contemporary character. So that's really, I think, a, a, a super important component of this. This is also Gus's, Gus's appearance, very simultaneously Gus and Lord Augustus. This is also important because this takes us to the end of our postmodern historiography where everything breaks down. The distinction between past and present is collapsed. And this is one of the things that Stoppard moves us toward throughout the play. So normally the way that we think of history working, or the way, the, the way that we think of history being studied, is events have happened in the past, and now in the present we are examining them. One of the things that Stoppard suggests to us, and um, I have, a, I have an article, a scholarly article coming out making this exact argument. Um, so in the, uh, in the fall 2016 issue of Modern Drama, if you want to look up my article, Compromised Epistemology, so you can get a better sense of this. Um, that was a shameless self-promotion, by the way. Um, but one of the things that, that, that Stopper does that disrupts this notion of historical narration as charting the past is that he has the contemporary historians come up with 
an idea, to come up with something that they want, or something, or to evoke something that they want. And then, in the next scene, or a couple of scenes later, that thing happens in the Regency period. So here's a really interesting example of this. Um, this is Act 2, Scene 5. This is where uh, Hannah is challenging Bernard over his theory that Byron kills Chater in a duel. Um, so Chloe says, let her, so they're, they're, they're talking about a potential letter that could explain everything, uh, that could answer all of the questions. So Chloe says, letters get lost. And Byron says, thank you, exactly. There's a platonic letter which confirms everything, lost but ineradicable, like radio voices rippling through the universe for all eternity. My dear Hodge, here I am in Albania, and you're the only person in the world who knows why. Poor C. I never wished him any harm, except in the Piccadilly, of course. It was the woman who bade me eat, dear Hodge. What a tragic business. But thank God it ended well for poetry. Yours ever be, P.S. Burn this. So Byron is, sar uh, so, sorry, so Bernard is sarcastically evoking this letter that would explain all of the gaps in his theory. Um, this is his sort of fantasy of what ideally you could find as a as an historian. But here's where Stoppard here's where Stoppard makes things interesting is in two six when we go back to the Regency period uh, when Lady Croom is confronting Septimus about Byron's actions. This is page twenty nine twenty nine. Uh, we get this stage direction here. Septimus has taken Byron's letter from his pocket and is now setting fire to a corner of it using the little flame from the spirit lamp. And then the next stage direction, the paper blazes in Septimus's hand and he drops it and let it, lets it burn out on the metal tray. So what we have here is, in one scene, Bernard says, here's the artifact that I would love to find that would confirm my theory in the face of all of your skeptics. Then in the next scene, the historical event that Bernard wishes into being, that Bernard sort of envisions into being, actually transpires. We have a letter from Byron that explains everything, and as Bernard sort of sarcastically suggests, it gets burned. Now, of course, we as audience members know that the thing that this letter explains the thing that has happened is not what Bernard thinks has happened. But nonetheless, we have this structure to the play. We have this movement to the play where Septimus burning this letter is retroactively fulfilling this uh, historical desire. So Bernard evokes something in the present, and then it happens in the past, so that we have that sort of verisimilitude between past and present. So this is really, I think, are, uh, some important stuff, important ways of disrupting historical knowledge, disrupting scientific knowledge, because again, this this also evokes chaos theory and this this approach to um, chaotic sciences, because in this case we have a sort of reverse of the input and output of the system. Because normally in his in history, the input would be the things that have happened in the past, and the output would be a narrative that gets constructed. But what happens here that's somewhat chaotic, somewhat chaos theory e, uh, which isn't really a word, but what happens here that's chaos inflected is that the input becomes the things that the contemporary historians are theorizing, and the output becomes the events that occurred in 1809. So we have this odd reversal of the input and output of this system in a way that reflects 
how chaos theory uh, suggests that changes in a system's input can produce different results.